Let us trust in the Lord at all times, for in Almighty God is our refuge. Verily, the Father of Christ is our rock and our salvation, for in the Holy One of Israel we find our strength. Let us pray. Almighty God, we pray that you would speak to us through your word, calling to us plainly and clearly so that we might understand your revelation, which draws us to higher ground. We ask, O Lord, that in this hour of prayer, that you would be generous with the outpouring of your spirit, granting us a double portion, that we might absorb more fully the mind of Christ who taught his disciples to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. A reading of Psalm 121. I lift up my eyes to the hills, from where will my help come? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. He will not let your foot be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. He who keeps Israel will neither slumber or sleep. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun shall not strike you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all evil. He will keep your life. The Lord will keep your going out and your coming in from this time on and forevermore. In our silent prayers, let us Remember and think of George Gray, Helen Loomis, O.B. O'Brien, Brad Martin, 
Heather and Ed Stevenson, Sona Wyman, Alan Dorn, Bill Young, Cody Pound, Perry Green, Finn Daly, Kayla Daly, Brooke Daly, Daniela and Matteo Siriello and their parents and all medical staff devoting their lives to helping children, all prisoners of war, all service women and servicemen, all innocents caught up in violence and unrest, all God's creatures, both great and small, pray we now in silence. O God, in whom we live and move and have our being, we come to worship in response to the promptings of your spirit, assured of your love and mercy, as we search for refuge under the protective shadow of your wing. As we approach your throne of grace, seeking your word through which we might find deeper meaning for our lives and for our souls, bless our longing to learn more about you and your son, so that we might serve your church and our neighbors more fully, knowing that in the faces of our neighbors, we might see the face of Christ, from whom we learn the way of life. O Lord of heaven and earth, who created us and created all that is or will be, we ask that you would hear us when we call upon you with the prayer of faith. Renew our hearts and our wills that we may praise you worthily for your great love which redeems us all. Lift up our thoughts and all the powers of our mind so that in your presence, while proclaiming the wonder of your grace and the mercy of your Son, we might rejoice in heart as we contemplate your truth and your love. O God eternal, who reigns in the highest heavens and yet abides with us in our homes, bless our worship and accept the praise we bring as we endeavor to be raised in newness of life, as we hear and receive your good news. May your wisdom and power, which were revealed so completely in and through your Son, transform us by lifting our thoughts so that we may find our desires molded and shaped by the example which Christ gave the world in his ministry and service. May anything which could dim our vision of you, everything that might prevent our discernment of your holy will, and all which threatens to keep us from perfect fellowship with you, be distanced from our hearts and minds as we strive to walk in the paths of righteousness for your name's sake. Hallow our thoughts, uplift our desires, grant us to be reverent before you, knowing that one day the pure in heart will see your face, that those who have been forgiven will fully know your love, and to those who trust you will be given the mind of Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Our scripture lesson this morning is from the New Testament, Paul's letter to the Colossians, chapter 3, verses 12 through 17. As God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, 
meekness, and patience. Bear with one another, and if anyone has a complaint against another, forgive each other. Just as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. Above all, clothe yourselves with love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in the one body. And be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Teach and admonish one another in all wisdom. And with gratitude in your hearts, sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs to God. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Here end the morning scripture lessons. For over 225 years, our congregation has gathered annually to take stock of where we have been and where we believe that God is leading us. As an ecclesiastical organization, our responses to demographic realities, to financial considerations, to geographical and political constraints, to spiritual and theological verities and experiences in our pilgrimage as part of the church universal, our responsive will not only determine the nature of our ministry for the next year, but may very well set the tone for our existence as the body of Christ in Colebrook over the next two centuries. How will we respond to our present realities. The attitudes with which we approach not only today's meeting, but also the perspectives which we bring each and every week as we gather in the pews to celebrate the resurrection of Christ on Sunday mornings, will influence not only the direction of our congregation, but will also shape our own personal lives in the light of eternity. An important factor in our character and our distinctive identity is that we are, and always have been, a church of the congregational way. 
Being Congregationalist is not the only way of being Christian, of course. But Congregationalism necessarily has an impact on the manner in which our Christianity is expressed. While there have been any number of Congregational thinkers over the centuries, one of whom was Isaac Watts, who composed the verses of our opening hymn this morning, our main theological contribution to Christendom does not lie in systems of doctrine or in creedal affirmations. It lies rather in a conviction that the way in which we work out our own salvation, to borrow a phrase from the Apostle Paul, is something to be accomplished under the guidance of the Holy Spirit when we are called as part of a gathered community of faith in a particular location, such as a parish. In other words, we don't make it up as we go along without reference to the wider Christian tradition, but we do cherish under the authority of scripture the freedom and the flexibility of making decisions pertaining to our here and now in Colebrook, brooking no external ecclesiastical interference by councils or synods. A second and related aspect of our temperament which has formed our character is found in our response to the question of where we think authority lies among us. One of my colleagues, the late Reverend Dr. John Elmore, who pastored South Congregational Church in the Hartford area during the 70s and 80s and 90s, once told me that the position of the congregational minister in his own parish was not unlike that of the Pope. Well, I was shocked when I heard that from the lips of a congregational clergyman, no less. But now, all these decades later, I think I have some idea of what Dr. Elmore was trying to say, in which I had heard others say as well, including the late and great John Ferris of our own congregation here in Colebrook. Maestro Ferris once addressed me, tongue in cheek, of course, as hair pastor, as if I had as clergy some sort of lordly authority that was more common among Missouri Synod Lutherans. And I guess that kind of thinking can go to one's head fairly quickly, if unchecked. In Congregationalism, though, the minister is not at the top of the heap of some kind of organizational pyramid even though the physical position of the pastor, for about an hour a week anyway, is up higher than the rest of us, unless he happens to be singing at the back of the meeting house in the choir, when as a result, the most exalted physical position is held by the organist up in the choir loft. But no, in congregationalism, our organizational chart, if it is a pyramid, is more like an upside-down pyramid with the congregation on top. Put another way, authority among us is not up there, but resides in the pews rather than in the pulpit. That's why we call ourselves Congregationalists and not, for example, Presbyterians. Presbyter being a pre-Reformation word for clergy. As it turns out, for historical as well as cultural reasons, we do probably have more in common with Presbyterians than with just about any other Christians, given our overlapping theologies. But we do have a different view of the role of clergy, because Congregationalists see final authority as resting in a group of laypersons within the parish. That means you there, down in the pews, rather than in a group of professionally trained seminary graduates, one of whom gets to preach once a week. 
practically speaking. This means that I, as the minister, will not chair today's annual meeting, and I will get just one vote like any other member of the congregation. Simply stated, I don't run Colebrook Congregational Church. You do. Well, we are told that the classic sermon should contain three points, so allow me to make one more point before we head into our annual meeting. And the third point for this morning is not only the flip side of the first point that I made, but is also related to the second question entertained only a moment ago about who is actually in charge here. It is to the Apostle Paul that we owe the scriptural image that the church is the body of Christ, with Christ being our head. As Congregationalists, as usual, we have a distinctive take on what Paul has to say, shaped by who we are. With Christ as the head of the church, Congregationalists conclude that we have no need of bishops, unless we think of the local pastor as the bishop of her local flock, nor do we have any synods and no presbyteries. And to be perfectly fair, I'm really not beating up on Presbyterians this morning, given that I was trained in a Presbyterian divinity school. But ecclesiastically speaking, we Congregationalists see nothing of the church outside and beyond the local congregation. There are any number of organizations related to the church that perform roles beneficial to the church and its members. I'm thinking here of seminaries and denominational offices and religious publishing houses and so on. But they are not, properly speaking, the church. Only a gathered body of believers who meet regularly to hear the word preached and by whom the sacraments are administered are the church at least in Congregationalism. Our Methodist and Episcopalian friends might suggest that Congregationalism's view of the church as not existing outside the local congregation is a bit impractical, if not overly simplistic. They further suggest that Congregationalism, therefore, is no way to run a church. And I guess everyone is entitled to their own opinion. But even though there are a lot more of them than there are of us, a UCC colleague of mine once memorably put it to me this way. The kingdom of God is not a democracy, so raw numbers do not determine who is right. Rather, all we need to do is to acknowledge the authority of Scripture and trust in the promises of Christ and God will sort out the rest. Amen.
May the love of God the Father, the grace of God the Son, and the fellowship of God the Holy Spirit be with us and in our homes and with our loved ones now and forevermore. Amen. <laughs>